He continues now on BBC One with Cathy Staff as the newly widowed Molly, no frills. me last night. Anyway, I think you should ask. Oh, hello, Grant. Hi. Uh, listen, me and Susie. Grant. What? Grandma. It should be Susie and I. Right. Susie and I was wondering. Grant, if... please. What? It should be Susie and I were wondering. Okay. Susie and I were wondering if you wanted anything from the shops, because I'm just going. That's very kind of you. No thanks, I've got to go myself later. Katie! Coming! Good luck. Oh, thanks. Katie! Catherine! What? Oh, it's you. <laughs> Hello, Katie. Of course it's me. You screeched, madam. Oh, did I? Well, what is it? Only I've been galloping up and down those stairs like something out of Cagney and Lacey, and I've got a lot to do. Oh, I love it, of course. Love what? I love lying here with an ice-cold hot water bottle, an itchy back, and lukewarm tea. The tea was hot when I brought it up. Yes, well, I couldn't reach very well. Not with this back. Oh, so it's your back now, is it? Well, at least we're narrowing it down. The back's definitely part of it. But you see, with my insides in the state they are, it could be touch and go. I might well have to have one of those operations where they put all your doings in a bag. <laughs> yes, it's called being evicted. <laughs> Only joking. Come on, Mum, it's not like you to moan. She said lying in her teeth. Oh, that's Nikki. I'll get her to pop up and have a look at you. I don't want any doctors near me, thank you very much. All I want is a cup of beef tea, a copy of the lady, and a fresh tube of liniment. Now, is that too much to ask? Beef tea? I can't make beef tea. You'll probably say I haven't simmered the cow for long enough. <laughs> it's perfectly simple. Have you got some muslin? An old party frock or something? Oh, I've got to dress up for this, have I? <laughs> Don't be silly. To strain the beef through. Of course. Silly old me. And would you like glazed peacock for your main course? <laughs> Anyone who think I fell over on purpose? I didn't ask to skid on a Georgette here. <laughs> Nikki. Yes, Pet? Can I ask you a, a hypothetical question? Ask away. If you had a 16-year-old daughter, would you let her go away camping for the weekend with her boyfriend? With only one tent? How many sleeping bags? Oh, two. Hmm. What? Well, it would rather depend. What, on contraception and everything, just in case anything happened? Which it wouldn't, because I'm very into virginity, actually. Oh, yes. And the weather, of course. Mammy leg! Oh, sorry, I thought I was on the back. Well, I didn't want to worry you, but my left leg was looking a bit blue this morning. Oh, well, I expect it was cold. What with me not keeping your bottle warm? Yes, well, I didn't think it was for me to say. Well, I will refill it for you in a minute. If only I had my old bed. I'd be perfectly happy. If I could believe that, I'd send for it Red Star. 
you were born in that bed. I remember your dad saying, Oh dear, it's a girl. Shall we send it back? <laughs> and I said, I'd rather not, love. I've gone to a lot of bother with it. <laughs> Shall we send it back? What kind of a remark's that to welcome a child into the world? Oh, he had a very droll sense of humour. <laughs> when he fell down the coal hole, he said, Never mind, we were getting a bit low on Nutty Slack. <laughs> we did laugh. <laughs> Thanks. I seem to remember I broke my arm. Oh, so you did. But young bones met very quickly. Well, it's a pity old ones don't. Shall I get you some fresh tea? No, love, don't bother with tea. Right. I could just fancy some lemon juice and hot water. Hot, mind, not boiling. We haven't got any lemons. Perhaps if someone just nipped to the shops? I'll be going to the shops later. Oh, come in. Let me introduce Madame Moliana Bikostavskaya with her celebrated interpretation of the dying swan. <laughs> you might just take a quick look and let me know what time to book the hearse. Oh, what a shame. I've come without my scalpel. <laughs> I know what's wrong with me, so don't start any of your fancy diagnosing. I wouldn't dare. And I don't want any of your fancy medicines either. If God wants to take me, he will. If not, it's no good clogging up my words with extracts of used placentas. Now, now, we mustn't be prejudiced, must we? That's all you get these days with doctors. Extracts. When I was young, it was syrup of figs, parishes chemical food and a good sweat. <laughs> You're forgetting the brown paper and goose grease. <laughs> and all this surgery is uncalled for, you know. Just tell me, would you want somebody else's liver and lights? Because I wouldn't. <laughs> and hormones. That's another thing. They never used to have them. Now everything you read is hormones. You tell me one thing. Have you ever seen a hormone? <laughs> well, you can't actually see them. Precisely. Right. I bet I can tell your mood just from looking at you. A blind, deaf and dumb, two-toed sloth could tell my mood. No, but this book on body language is great. I can tell whether people like me or not. Now, Grant definitely likes and respects me because he sits with his legs crossed in an open posture and points his knee towards me in a protective and respectful way. I see. And look at you. Shoulders slumped, head tilted downwards, surly expression. It all spells one thing, the change of life. <laughs> Thanks. You probably don't remember what it's like to be passionately in love. Uh, well, when I say passionately, I mean romantically in a rather platonic sort of way. It can't be the change of life. I'm far too young. My surly expression is purely to do with the fact that your grandmother is treating me like a cross between Jeeves and a St. Bernard. Lift that pillow, tote that liniment, Katie, peel me a grape. It can't go on, you know. Do you want me to wash up or anything? You have terrific timing. The trouble with you is you're too English. Is that an insult? You've got to learn to ask, Mum. If you want me to wash up, it's no good standing at the sink splashing about looking martyred. You should hand me the dishcloth and say, Susie, wash up. Susie, dry up. <laughs> you know, if you were on a train and the carriage caught fire and there were flames licking at the windows, you'd look up and you'd say, is anybody warm or is it just me? That's not true. <laughs> You've got to learn to stand up to her, contradict her, defy her opinions, right? Just ignore her. Well, that's all very well, just ignore her. Well, suppose she really needs something. She might fall out of bed and hurt herself, or worse. And then I would have to live with the guilt, and believe me, I've already got guilt up to my eyebrows. Do you know I would still be mortified if she found out that I once left you with a babysitter who gave you a box of matches to rattle? Yeah. <laughs> and what about when I had mumps and you insisted it was just a swollen gland and made me go to school? And then I fainted in geography and had to come home in a taxi? I love you too. <laughs> I could sit up with Grandma later and you could put your feet up. That's very sweet of you. 
I could study her body language. Then I'll be able to tell how ill she really is. <laughs> now, don't go upsetting her. There you go. Not much wrong there. Mm, I know you, doctors. It's a well-known fact. You get all breezy and ridiculous when it's somewhat fatal. You have not got anything fatal, I promise. I think you've just strained your back. What you need is a hot bath and a massage. Massage? I'll be in the news of the world. <laughs> I've read about those places. All whips and French polishing, whatever that means. <laughs> Although I think I can hazard a guess. No whips involved, just a back rub with some cream. Kate will do it for you, or I will. If it means lifting me nighty up again, I'll keep it in the family, thank you. <laughs> and before that, a nice steamy bath, just to relax your muscles. If I were you, I'd have a sauna. Oh, no. I know all about them, too. <laughs> Saunas, sitting in a wooden box with a lot of Swedes, naked, <laughs> doing things with twigs. I don't want to go into details, but for a woman of my age, well, it could see me off. Don't get excited. An ordinary bath will do. And a good job, too. You won't catch me with any naked Swedes. I don't imagine so. Or in a massage parlour. Absolutely not. They're a funny lot, the Swedes. They don't have tops to the sandwiches, you know. <laughs> it can't be good for them. All that lettuce and no tops. <laughs> oh, any chance of a cup of tea? Yeah. I'll uh, go and see if Gran wants anything. What do you think of Mum, then? Oh, it's nothing. Just a spot of ASing. ASing? Attention seeking. That's a recognised medical condition, is it? ASing? Well, I'm a doctor and I recognise it. Plus a little bit of back trouble. Hot bath and a massage should help. So what else can I do to help? Has she got any hobbies? Hobbies? That woman has hobbies the way other people have mice. Name a hobby, she's got it. Knitting, cooking, embroidery, reading, gardening, Bible study, hymn singing, criticizing, interfering. I think she wants you to take more notice of her. What? Speaking as an expert, my own mother is still alive. She's in a home. You put her in a home. When she spilled her barley water, you said she was incontinent and had her whisked away. <laughs> she loves it. They have sing songs. Anyway, I'm talking about your mother, dear. Hand her to her a bit more. If you feel impatient with her, I've got a few Buddhist chants you could do. Oh, drop dead. <laughs> By the way, she said if she was going to be a burden, it might be better not to send for her Royal Albert tea service. I said drop dead. Did you know that in Greece, shaking your head means yes and nodding means no? How confusing. You should try it on Mum. Be good laugh. You could refuse to speak, and whatever she asked, you could just nod or shake your head, but do it the wrong way around. I'm too poorly for practical jokes, love. Yeah, you can grow out of things like that when you get really mature. I feel really grown up and old me. Like, I used to be desperate to meet a bloke who wore a leather trench coat and smoke French fags. And now I've got this mature realisation that I'm only ever going to meet blokes with sweaty palms and legs like pipe cleaners. <laughs> Last I heard, you were in love with that young Grant. Yeah, but he's like my main squeeze, so he's not exciting. You're what? We're an item. Oh, you've lost me. Would you like a palm of violet? No, thanks. They make you smell like a hen party. <laughs> Tell me some more about when Mum was little. Right. Where is she? Gossiping with a friend? Mm. I expect they're talking about women's problems. All this talk. We never went in for it, bringing everything to the surface. It's all very well, but once you've got it to the surface, what do you do with it then? Where does it go? Search me. Anyway, your mum. Now, where was I up to last time? Right, I'm oh, just... Oh, mum, go away. Oh. Come back again, dear. We're just having a little chat. Oh, your royal highnesses. I'm so terribly, terribly sorry. How could I have been so crass as to appear at the wrong moment? Please, execute me at your earliest convenience. <laughs> She's very moody, isn't she? <laughs> right. Now, did I tell you about the time she tried to eat her own weight in Pontefract cakes? <laughs> OK, 
Can I just take this piece for Jemima? Oh, yes, of course. I'll get her some more. Oh, no, one piece is fine. I'm on a diet. Oh, we all are. I was talking to Susie just now. Oh, yes? Yes, we were having a chat about uh, contraception. I suppose she was nagging you to go in for it. Well, five kids is a wee bit excessive. Anyway, I thought Gavin was supposed to be having a vasectomy. Oh, he was. But he was a bit nervous about it, so I was demonstrating to him exactly what was involved, using two lumps of plasticine, a bit of leftover macaroni, and a rubber glove. <laughs> well, it was all right when I made the incision in the rubber glove, but when I pulled out the macaroni and snipped it in half, he went white as a sheet and dashed out of the room. So he's not going to bother, then? Oh, he's having the operation, but he's gone right off pasta. <laughs> anyway, that's not what Susie and I were talking about. It wasn't? No. But you were discussing contraception. But not your contraception. You were, in fact, discussing... Her contraception. Just give me the bottom line. She hasn't. She isn't. She won't. She says. But in case she does... Well, that seems a bit cold-blooded. It's better than being hot-blooded, then regretting it. Think about it. Talk to her. And if you like, tell her to come and see me. Thanks. Oh, God, I feel old. <laughs> <laughs> And there she was, in the middle of Blackpool Beach, explaining quite calmly to the ice cream man that she'd buried her father and forgotten whereabouts. <laughs> <laughs> and did he happen to know if the tide was coming in or going out? <laughs> oh, hello, love. You don't need to knock. I brought your new bottle. Oh, I don't want it now, love. It's gone quite close, don't you think? <laughs> Watch it, Gran. She'll be fetching her bucket in spades. <laughs> you wouldn't believe what I've been hearing about you, Mum. What's she been telling you? What have you been telling her? Sorry. Nikki said I must be patient with you. Why? <laughs> Why have you got to be patient? I'm really ill, aren't I? I knew it. I had an instinct about it. Now, Kate, I don't want you to spare me feelings. Can I have that in writing? Now, we've a lot to sort out, so you must tell me how long I've got. Now, as regards the coffin, I want a brass plaque on the lid, <laughs> wording as follows. Molly Amelia Bickerstaff. No dates. I suppose they'll have to go on the gravestone but I don't want people talking about my age over the ham sandwiches. <laughs> then I want, God give me work till my life is through and life till my work is done. Now, have you got that or do you want me to write it down? Apart from being sanctimonious, it doesn't make sense. You gave up work years ago. I did not. What about my charity work? What charity work? Knitting. Yes, well, I'm sure if it had to, the Third World could manage without your green and purple striped egg cosies. <laughs> You'll regret all this when I'm not here. It'll all come back to haunt you. You can never take back the spoken word. Oh, for heaven's sake, Mother, it's like talking to a flipping sampler. Right, now, you've got to have a nice hot bath. What's nice about it? Just a bath with two taps and a plug hole <laughs> and some soapy water. I don't know why everybody's making such a song and dance about it. I'll run your bath for you and I'll put in some of that nice herbal tonic. Nikki says it will do you good. What sort of herbs? Pine. Pine's not a herb, it's a tree. All right, <laughs> some of that nice tree tonic. I don't want to bath in tree droppings. Mother, animals have droppings, not trees. What about conkers? <laughs> oh, I want some of my nice lavender bath cubes. Here we are. Mother, if it'll make you any happier, you can have a gravy cube. Give it here. <laughs> oh, it's all right. I'm not helpless. I can crumble my own cubes. And I'm not taking me nighty off while you massage me. Thought I wasn't seeing you till tonight. Want an orange juice? Yeah, tar. I couldn't wait. Oh, couldn't wait. That's dead romantic. No, I, I don't mean I couldn't wait to see you. I just mean there's something I've got to ask you about. What? Yeah, well, sit down. Why? Because if you don't, you're going to fall over. What? What? 
I want us to get engaged. <laughs> Jokes. I'm serious, Suze. I really, really care about you. I want to make an honest woman of you. <laughs> oh, leave it, Al. What's up with you? Oh, what's the problem? Do you think I don't care about you? Well, I know you're dead devoted to me. It's just this engagement bit. Yeah, well, drink your orange juice. Don't waste it. I know what you've done. You've put some kind of aphrodisiac in it, haven't you? So you can have your wicked way with me. What's in it? Powdered rhino horn? Cool, I ain't like this in the movies. Look, look, just look in the glass. Where did you get this? No, you're getting the lines wrong. You say, darling, it's... It's wonderful. But I never call you darling. <laughs> Whatever. No, but come on. Why? I love you. I want our weekend away to be the beginning of a lifetime together. Oh, Susie. Susie, say yes. I'd have to ask me mum. Remember that? It's a real diamond, Mum, isn't it? Of course it isn't. Look, Susie, this whole thing is ridiculous. The idea of your getting engaged is just stupid. And anyway, you're both far too young. Yeah, but Grant desperately wants to. It's dead sweet. I mean, it's desperately flattering when someone's that keen. Strikes me as rather strange. Well, thanks a lot. Look, I really think you should just give him his ring back and tell him it's much too soon to be thinking along those lines. The other thing is, he wants us to go away camping for the weekend. Oh, well, that's okay, as long as you're careful. Yeah! <laughs> what? I don't know. What kind of a mother are you? You tell me I can't get engaged, but I can swan off for the weekend with Grant. You're just an old hippie, that's what you are. Look, Susie, you are too young to get engaged, and that's an end to it. You just don't care about my moral welfare. You'll be lighting joysticks next. Putting LSD in my cocoa, I shouldn't wonder. Hey, far out. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry, Mum, but you know. Wait till you're a mother. You'll find out. Anyway, I must make a start on dinner. It's very significant you've turned your back on me. It's all in this book. <laughs> Susie. If I peel the potatoes facing you, the peel will fall on the floor. <laughs> There's probably a footnote that explains that. <laughs> nope. <laughs> OK, well, let's be having it then. Now who's being unromantic? Oh, yeah, sorry. Is this any better? My darling, do pray tell me, what is your answer to my proposal? No. Well, what was wrong with that? No, that was fine. I mean, no, as in no. Oh, Susie, what, what's Mom, the problem? Are you okay? My mum says we're too Dinner young. Will be ready at seven. But I can come away with you for the weekend as long as I'm careful. Smart. That's okay then. Smart? You're supposed to be devastated. You're supposed to sit at home sobbing, playing all our favourite records. Yeah. No, nah, it's all okay now. You see, my mum said that she reckoned your mum wouldn't let us go unless we was engaged. But if your mum says that's OK, then it's fine. I mean, I've got to ring off my sister. Swapped it for my low hair sweater. What? It was all a cheap trick to get me to go away with you. You bastard! All that stuff about love and devotion. You make me sick. Go away! Yeah, but, but it was my mum's idea. It, you know how old-fashioned she is. Well, uh, she made me do it. That's even worse, you wimp! Go away! Now, Susie, listen! Just Ma, let me go! Oh, can you hear me? Listen to me, Go please. away! No, Open this listen door. To me, I don't want to go to it anymore. Ma, are you all right? Ma! I do love you, no. honest! I no, do! Susie, let Susie, let come quickly. I think your granny's fainted in the bath or something. Oh, no. Ma, Grant says he never really no, wanted to get engaged in the bath. Shut up! Don't you think he's a total? Oh, Susie, never mind getting engaged. Go and phone a fire 
Sonny, just a minute. Is that your ring, is it? The bathroom window doesn't open and it's very high up. Don't worry, love. We'll soon have her out. Come on, lads. Oh, Mum, you stupid, silly, bloody old woman. <laughs> Whatever's going on? Take those damn things off your ears, you daft old bat. <laughs> Are we on fire? I must go and get my birth certificate and my spare teeth. Are you going to carry me down the ladder, young man, or do I have to jump into a blanket? There's no fire, Gran. It's you they've come to rescue. Do you realise what you've done? We've had the police, the ambulance, the fire brigade all hurtling through the streets. The bathroom door was about to be hacked to bits. If I've inconvenienced anyone, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Incidentally, I couldn't let the water out because of my back. Now, I must go and put some talcum powder between my toes. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Pleasure. Um, would you like some tea? <laughs> <laughs> and all it was, his mum put him up to it, saying that my mum wouldn't let us go away unless we were engaged. It was my worst ever humiliation, Gran. Oh, what a shame. There are some lovely dresses in Wedding World at the moment. <laughs> you could have had the Royal Albert Tea Service as a wedding present. I could have worn my Jade Paisley two-piece and the hat with the osprey feather. For the engagement tea, that is. Of course, for the actual nuptials, I'd have wanted something new. Yeah. I could have worn my snakeskin boots and the shocking pink taffeta. Still. A finger buffy would you have had, or a sit-down knife and fork do? Dunno, really. It was dead romantic, Gran. The ring at the bottom of the orange juice glass and all. Oh, they do that in films. But it's champagne. Still, love. There's plenty of time. It's deeply ironic, actually. He did all that just so that we could go away. And now I never want to see him again. And Mum said I could go anyway. She didn't. She did. <laughs> Katie! <laughs> Katie! I want a word with you, madam. Catherine! Coming! And Cathy Staff is back with no frills at the same time, 8.30 next Monday. Turn on to BBC One for the action and drama of the 1988 Olympic Games, starting this Friday at 10.15. See it all on BBC One. BBC Two's season of new Australian movies in a couple of minutes features the story of a racehorse which, after a very unpromising start, went on to become a legendary champion in the 1930s, Far Lap. At 9.30, Panorama looks at what measures can be taken to cope with the huge increase in traffic on our roads. Panorama in half an hour on BBC One. The nine o'clock news from the BBC with Nicholas Witchell and Philip Hayton. The bomb has exploded in the centre of Belfast tonight. Eight people have been hurt. The province's top civil servant who survived a bomb this morning has said civil servants will not be intimidated. The mail will soon be moving again. The postal strike has been settled. 
A shooting in central London, a Cuban diplomat detained with a gun has claimed immunity. And Barclays has raised its mortgage rate to 13%. The other lenders may follow. Good evening. A car bomb has exploded close to Belfast City Hall tonight. A man and a woman have been seriously injured. Six other people have been hurt. Police were trying to clear the area when the explosion occurred shortly after 7 o'clock. The head of the civil service in Northern Ireland, Sir Kenneth Bloomfield, who survived a bomb attack this morning, has said neither he nor his colleagues will be intimidated by terrorism. Sir Kenneth, his wife and son were shocked but unhurt in the attack on their home. Afterwards, Sir Kenneth said the civil service would not be deterred from its duty to democratic government. The Prime Minister said the bomb attack on the Bloomfields showed the total lack of human feeling of the IRA. Reporting from Belfast, first on tonight's bomb in the city centre, Dennis Murray. The bomb was in a black taxi left in a narrow street between office buildings. A number of people were injured as the area was being cleared. Police say there was only a few minutes warning, a totally insufficient time for them to evacuate the area, they said. One of the injured was a bus driver leaving a nearby I canteen. I just got the couple of steps. I've seen the flush and the bang and it hit the ground. That was all. It's estimated that 50 to 100 pounds of the powerful Semtex explosive were used. That was also in the four bombs used in an IRA attack on the home of civil servant Sir Kenneth Bloomfield. The bombs were left in a circle round the house, but only two exploded. The others had also been packed with bullets. The house was severely damaged. Police who were on the scene within three minutes actually stepped over one of the bombs to rescue the Bloomfield family. There was one at the front door, I understand, and one seen at the side of the house. And once that was seen, then we cleared the whole area then after that. So your men risked their lives, actually? Yes, I would think so. Sir Kenneth, his wife Elizabeth Lady Bloomfield and their son Timothy were treated in hospital for shock. The IRA in a statement said they were warning other senior civil servants involved in formulating or advising on military strategy to resign their posts or, in their words, face the consequences. Sir Kenneth is Northern Ireland's top civil servant, closely involved in the workings of the Anglo-Irish Agreement and ministerial meetings held under it. One of those is expected tomorrow. Army experts removed the Semtex found at his house. It's been supplied to the IRA by Libya. The British and Irish governments will discuss how to get hold of the IRA's supply. We both have a tough job. It's got to be fun because everybody can see otherwise uh, what uh, nasty and damaging uh, impact it can have uh, and the human tragedy that it can cause. Mr King reviewed security for VIPs today. Only last Friday the RUC warned the IRA's aiming for a horrific end to 1988. The commander of the SAS team that killed three members of the IRA in Gibraltar has denied suggestions that the soldiers were given a license to kill. The officer, identified as Soldier F, told the inquest into the three deaths that it had been the intention to arrest the terrorists rather than kill them. But he said his men had had to act quickly when the three split up to prevent the lives of ordinary people from being put at risk. The van bringing the SAS commander back to continue his evidence dropped him off at the court building before dawn. The stage set for his cross-examination by Paddy McGrory, acting for the IRA members' families. Five hours of questioning boiled down to this. Was the soldier telling the truth? Did the SAS ever intend to arrest rather than kill? It was keen verbal sparring between the SAS officer in his clipped military tone and the Belfast lawyer with his broad Ulster brogue. At one stage, when the solicitor looked down at his notes, Soldier F stopped and asked him, am I boring you, Mr McGrory? He rounded on him sharply. Soldier, it's not for you to say when you should or shouldn't continue. Soldier F denied that when the SAS took over the operation, deaths were inevitable. In three quarters of the cases, when they were called in to make arrests, no one was killed. Michael Hucker, the lawyer acting for the soldiers, asked him, did you hoodwink the Gibraltar police over your real intentions? Our chances of doing that would be the same as selling ice cream to Eskimos. Have you been telling lies? 
Were you ordered by anybody to kill the three terrorists? No, I was not. We were to arrest them and bring them to court as criminals, where they would receive their just desserts for attempting what they did in Gibraltar. An explosives expert said walkie-talkie radios could have detonated the IRA's bomb from anywhere in Gibraltar. In the narrow, crowded streets, 140 pounds of Semtex, the most powerful explosive known to man, would have been absolutely devastating, one of the most violent bombs ever produced in a city centre. This is Neil Bennett for the 9 o'clock news in Gibraltar. A foreign diplomat has opened fire with a gun in a London street tonight. Some reports say one man was slightly injured. According to eyewitnesses, a diplomat from the Cuban embassy fired at three men following him in a car. One of the shots hit a bus. The diplomat was arrested but was released after claiming full diplomatic immunity. Tonight in London, police trying to piece together exactly what happened. First came reports of a shooting, a man allegedly opening fire and injuring at least one. Police then arrived on the scene, sealed it off. A man surrendered, they say, and was then taken to the local police station. There, he claimed diplomatic immunity. His status was established, say the police, and it's thought that he's the Cuban embassy's third secretary. Local people heard the shooting, and one woman saw the immediate aftermath. While the people were running, I've noticed uh, a man, a little, few paces behind them, one of these men, uh, you know, dabbing his forehead with a handkerchief. And even from here, I could see it was full of blood. Did it so look as if he was badly hurt? Uh, well, no, I think it was more like a grace than, than, than a bad injury, because the other three people didn't seem to be too much bothered by the injury. This incident comes little over a week after a Vietnamese diplomat was photographed brandishing a gun outside his embassy. Vietnam refused to waive his diplomatic immunity, and in line with the government's efforts to clamp down on abuses of diplomatic privilege, the diplomat was expelled. The government's policy was toughened after the shooting four years ago of the policewoman Yvonne Fletcher by someone inside the Libyan People's Bureau. Tonight, there was no comment from the Cuban embassy, though the Cuban ambassador's due at the Foreign Office in a few minutes' time. He's been summoned for a meeting at which Foreign Office officials are sure to make Britain's displeasure known. Any announcement of action, though, won't come till later tonight or tomorrow. The police have called for tougher firearms laws following yesterday's shootings in Walsall. 18-year-old Anthony Haskett shot and wounded three youths with the shotgun before killing himself. Police have today shown a hoard of weapons found at his home. This is the frightening array of weapons police found at the home of the Midlands teenager who brought terror to the streets of Walsall yesterday before turning his shotgun on himself. They include knives and a machete, an air pistol, a crossbow, military-style balaclavas and camouflage paste. One of the three youths he shot and injured in his drunken rampage outside this restaurant tonight relived his nightmare. I think he was just angry and like, he just wanted to get it out of his system, like, and he just shot at anybody. Like, well, really, I think he just fired the gun and whoever was in the way got hit. But it's now emerged that Michael's shotgun wounds were caused by a teenager with a criminal conviction. There was a minor blemish on his character uh, 12 months ago when he got himself involved in a bit of trouble in Warsaw when some criminal damage was caused uh, to a statue. On the basis of that, it did not pose him as a person as being a threat to public safety or public tranquility. And so under the circumstances, the issue of a shotgun certificate, albeit with hindsight, was perfectly legitimate. Every time that this kind of incident occurs, it just shows that we've got to change the balance in favour of public safety and allow, for example, a chief constable to ask questions as to why somebody needs a shotgun certificate if he thinks it's a doubtful case and send his firearms officer to look at the home, at the house, to see how that shotgun is going to be safely kept. Now, if you think about what we know about the tragedy yesterday, you'll see that both those powers in our new bill are very important and realistic. Incidents like this do nothing for the confidence of thousands of responsible shooters who find their sport under attack. I personally don't see any reason why we should be in the business of uh, promoting gun clubs for pleasure. Uh, fun and firearms don't mix. 
the, the shooting community values uh, uh, the, the rights which they've worked hard to obtain. Um, it, it makes them a law-abiding section of the community. They feel therefore very hard done by when uh, uh, you get an aberration such as this. But today there was one piece of encouraging news. The first firearms amnesty in England, Scotland and Wales for 20 years has brought in 9,000 weapons in the first week. One man handed in 63, including German machine guns from both world wars. The amnesty, with the promise of no questions asked, continues till the end of the month. The postal strike is over. Post office staff should be back at work tomorrow, although workers in several places, including London and Merseyside, have given a mixed reaction to the news. The settlement came this afternoon after the post office and the union agreed to hold more talks about the payment of bonuses to staff in the southeast, the issue which caused the dispute. It's going to be some days, though, before the massive backlog of letters and parcels is cleared. The postal workers' leader, Alan Tuffin, said it was a very successful agreement for his members, if not a victory. There'll be talks on additional payments for staff in difficult recruiting areas in the southeast. But the existing payments will continue while the talks take place. Local union and post office managers will decide how the backlog of mail is cleared. But nationally, the union has cleared the use of extra casual staff. Mr Tuffin hopes most workers will be back by Thursday. They've made a great sacrifice. On average, uh, they've lost uh, between 150 to 200 pounds a week uh, uh, over the period. Uh, there's no, been no strike pay from the union. So I believe our members actually want to get back. But with 150 million letters stuck in the post, it could be a fortnight before services are back to normal in some areas. Deliveries could be resumed within a day or two, perhaps on a limited basis, one delivery a day to start with, that we would progressively open up the pillar boxes. We are going to be giving priority to first class, to parcels, to data posts, and then later to second class and to bulk mail. It's the sort of deal that leaves both sides free to claim something of a victory. The management and the union both say they want the agreement to succeed. So everything now depends on how Britain's 100,000 striking postal workers see it. Already some workers are expressing doubts about the deal. I'd like to see something more concrete really rather than just talking because the main issue that we came out for was to decide this. I mean, if we go back and we talk about it, we could be in the same situation a couple of weeks, a couple of months from now. I was on strike. Now it's been resolved, really, is it? We're still in the same situation, just go back to work. Nothing, nothing to go back. We ain't, we ain't won nothing, we ain't got nothing out of it. The union says it's reserving the right to demand an independent inquiry into industrial relations in the post office. There have been more than 200 local disputes in the past year alone. During this latest stoppage, the government has said little. Earlier this year, the Trade and Industry Department decided against lifting the post office letter monopoly. Already there have been calls for the government to think again. The events of the next few days could determine how ministers react to those calls. The cost of a mortgage is going up again. Barclays Bank is raising its interest rate on home loans by more than 1% to 13% from tomorrow. Other banks and building societies are also expected to put up their rates. A rise in mortgage payments has been certain since the banks put up their base rates last month. Barclays are the first off the mark, but the building societies won't be far behind. The Abbey National said tonight that it expects to make an announcement next week. Mortgage rates stood at only 9.75% at the beginning of last May. They shot up to 115 in August, and from the 1st of October, most building societies will be charging around 12.5%. On an average repayment mortgage of £25,000, that'll mean an increase of £13, up to £218.57 a month. On a £40,000 mortgage, payments will be up £23 to £361.69. The big lenders aren't sure whether these increases will be the last. There's been speculation that bank base rates could rise still further which could happen if new figures on Thursday show that earnings are still surging, or if there's an unexpectedly steep jump in the retail price index on Friday. It's been an unsettled time for homeowners, and it may not be over yet. Rudolf Cordes, the West German businessman who's been held hostage in Lebanon for the last 20 months, could be free by morning. 
In one of a series of statements issued in Beirut today, his kidnappers said he'd be released within 12 hours. But later, the group said he'd be freed only if representatives from West Germany, Iran and Syria turned up at a hotel in West Beirut. This statement was accompanied by a photograph of Mr. Cordes. The Beirut Press Corps, a surprisingly active and independent group of people, waited this morning for Mr. Cordes to be released, but in vain. They'd been alerted by a letter published in today's an nahar newspaper in Beirut. It was in German, and the writing was hard to decipher. It read in part, I'll be released on Monday, please inform my family, but please do everything regarding Mohammed, please help. Mohammed is assumed to be Mohammed Ali Hamadi, who's on trial in West Germany at the moment for hijacking and murder. Mr. Cordes was kidnapped within days of Hamadi's arrest in January last year, and Hamadi's trial in Frankfurt, under conditions of considerable security, still seems to be determining Mr. Cordes' freedom. It may well be that the kidnappers are offering to release Mr. Cordes purely in order to influence the outcome of the trial. The part that Hamadi played in the TWA hijack three years ago is central to the Frankfurt trial. Hamadi has admitted taking part in the hijacking, but denies having murdered the US Navy diver who was one of the passengers. It's thought to be Hamadi in these pictures who's reaching across the TWA pilot and brandishing the gun. And today the pilot himself, John Testrake, told the court in Frankfurt he believed Hamadi did carry out the murder on board the plane. That could well affect the outcome of the case, and it won't have helped the chances that the German hostage Rudolf Cordes will be released. Still, Hamadi claims he was only 17 at the time of the murder, and if he's found guilty, he'll certainly get a shorter sentence than an adult murderer would. All this has been discussed in the past by the West German Foreign Minister, Mr. Genscher, and the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran. But when they met last Friday, it's thought they reached an agreement which would lead to Mr. Cordes' release. And although Mr. Genscher has denied strenuously that his government has paid a ransom to get its other hostages in Lebanon freed, it's widely believed that when Alfred Schmidt was released a year ago, his company paid £6 million to get him back. We don't know if Rudolf Cordes is the subject of a similar agreement now. But if Mr. Cordes is indeed freed tomorrow, it'll be proof that Iran and its government are central to the problem of the Western hostages in Lebanon, and that Iran can, when it so chooses, get them released. In the past year, both West Germany and France have found that to be true. But the kind of deals Paris and Bonn have been prepared to countenance aren't acceptable to Britain. Nevertheless, circumstances have helped the British government do some of the things Iran would like. Today, for instance, the Foreign Office said for the first time that there was compelling evidence that Iran's enemy, Iraq, had used poison gas against its Kurdish population. We'll have to see if Mr. Cordes, the German hostage, is indeed freed tomorrow. But if he is, then things will look a little better for the British hostages too. South Africa's President P.W. Boerta has made his first visit to one of the major frontline states bordering his country. He flew to Songo in Mozambique to meet the President, Joachim Shizano. The two men said they'd try to improve relations between their countries. A South African Air Force Dakota brought President Boerta to remote northern Mozambique. Rare foreign travel for a president shunned by most of the world. And the first time Mr. Berta has been welcomed officially to one of the black frontline states bordering South Africa. <laughs> Venue for the talks, the Kahora Bassa Dam straddling the Zambezi, symbol of South Africa's past destabilization and promise of future cooperation. President Berta looked in awe at one of Africa's largest hydroelectric schemes which his support for the right-wing Renamo rebels has helped to undermine. The rebels have destroyed the power lines away from the dam, power which could supply several nations, now reaches only a single town. But the South African delegation touring the power station made idle by war insists their support for the rebels is ended, that they want to help repair the lines and buy most of the electricity. After an hour and a half of talks, the two ideological enemies said they should and would seek to coexist. For the South African government, few foreign policy breakthroughs could be as spectacular as the sight of their president made welcome in black Africa, and it couldn't have come at a better time. Many of President Berta's own National Party supporters question his achievements at home. They see repression increasingly replacing reform. So President Berta, reaching 10 years in office this month, is delighted to be seen exchanging gifts with a black neighbour, not trading insults.
This is James Robbins for the 9 o'clock news at Cahora Bassa in Mozambique. The first major consignment of relief supplies for victims of the flooding in Bangladesh has arrived in Dakar. An American transport plane has landed with water purification units and emergency shelters. President Ershad says Bangladesh will need aid for some time, and he's appealed to other countries not to tire of giving. Not much is working in the Bangladesh transport network. A few miles of railway track here and there. But none of the main centers connected. On the outskirts of Dhaka, just the rails are swaying above the river Turag. This is the main bridge connecting the capital with the entire railway system in the rest of Bangladesh. The girders supporting both lines were swept away in seconds. And throughout the country, bridges are down, tracks submerged and embankments eroded. Repairs are basic and difficult to effect in the fast currents, and there is no estimate as to when the rail system might be back in business. The roads are a bigger problem. Almost three quarters inundated throughout the country, and hundreds of miles damaged. The cattle munch on the tons of water hyacinth, which has quickly scrambled over the roads. Clearing them, 60 pence a day for each worker, is followed by bamboo fence work and sandbags. Again, the roads were constructed expensively above what had been previous flood levels. You know the task is colossal, and my resources are very limited. We are trying our best. I cannot say for sure that we are reaching everywhere. What resources have I got to reach to these 30 or 40 million people? The aid is beginning to arrive. The Americans this morning with a huge plane load of water tanks and cans, plastic shelters and two water purification units. Boats, tents and blankets follow later this week. The water is receding in most districts, though slowly, and it leaves a rising score of disease, snake bites and devastation. This is Kate Aidy for the 9 o'clock news in Dhaka. Tessa Sanderson, one of Britain's brightest hopes for a gold medal in the Olympics, has injured her leg just five days before the start of the Games. She was hurt while practicing with the javelin at the British training camp in Tokyo. Tessa Sanderson had been a happy and relaxed figure inside the camp. Her long-standing Achilles tendon injury seemed to be on the mend and she was playfully confident of retaining her title. I'm training very hard and I'm looking forward to the comp and especially to every Joe Bloggs and working men and women in the street. I should be trying my damnedest best to come back with that gold medal. But by this afternoon, she was a helpless figure, being carried on a fellow athlete's back into the treatment room. One of the first to visit her was Daly Thompson. Apparently, so much pressure had built up inside her ankle that the skin simply gave way. 20 stitches were put into a wound about an inch long, far more than normal, but with the game so close, it has to mend quickly. She was driven away in Thompson's car, but it was then announced that she wouldn't need to rest for as long as first feared. I would think she'll be certainly on the move in a couple of days. She'll be walking around here, and uh, certainly by tomorrow, I would think, and given another day, she'll be back to some form of light jogging. It is still likely that Tessa Sanderson will compete at the Olympic Games, but her chances of actually taking the gold medal again must have suffered a serious setback. Saddening news when the number of British athletes with a realistic chance of winning is still fairly small. Steve Cram is in that small number. The limp was put on. His injury, at least, is now something to joke about. This is Michael Peshart for the 9 o'clock news in Japan. Now more on the shooting incident in central London, allegedly involving a Cuban diplomat. Police are still at the scene of the shooting. From there, Andrew Taylor reports. The police here aren't in any hurry to force a conclusion. Once they had possession of the gun, most of the tension went out of the situation, though they have been outside the diplomat's flat here for more than three hours now. It all started in a very low-key approach. To begin with, they didn't even bother to cordon off the street outside, though now they're holding people back about 100 yards from the flat window behind official tapes, just as a precaution. The police are obviously prepared to sit this out and wait for the diplomats to reach an agreement. And we understand the Cuban ambassador has just arrived at the Foreign Office to see Timothy Egar. The Foreign Office minister is seeking an urgent explanation after the shooting incident. And tonight's other headlines again. 
A car bomb has exploded in the center of Belfast tonight, injuring eight people and causing extensive damage. And the postal strike is over, but it could take two weeks to clear the backlog of mail. And that's the nine o'clock news tonight from Philip and from me. Good night. And now the news for the South. Good evening. Brighton's head postmaster, John Dunlop, has warned that even when postmen go back to work, it could be a week before services are completely restored. In common with other areas of the country, tons of mail are crammed into full post boxes. Talks are now being held at a local level about the nationally agreed return to work. Meanwhile, there is concern that the postal strike could soon lead to a shortage of blood for transfusion. Regular donors normally receive postal reminders, but now it's feared many will forget to give blood. After armed robberies at two public houses at Runfold near Farnham in Surrey, police have warned landlords to be extra vigilant at closing time. At the Jolly Farmer, two men forced staff and customers to lie on the floor while they stole takings. Fifteen minutes later, they carried out a similar raid at the Princess Royal a quarter of a mile away. No one was injured in either raid, but a total of about £5,000 was taken. Detectives are searching for a young girl after four boys saw her being seriously sexually assaulted in school grounds at Totten near Southampton. Police have set up an instant room, but they haven't yet been contacted by the family of the girl, who was aged between four and seven. The attacker was in his teens, and it's feared that the incident hasn't been reported because he's known to the family. Labour's health spokesman Robin Cook has been told by nurses in Brighton that they are prepared to take industrial action over money for regrading. He met them on the eve of fresh talks over implementing the deal. The world powerboat racing champion Steve Curtis from Southampton has had a setback in his fight to retain his title. He came ninth in the first race of this year's championships off Guernsey. Today's rough seas made the going difficult, but he's hoping for greater success in the remaining two races. Finally, a Gosport man is taking a well-earned rest after setting a new world record for the longest ever auction sale. 62-year-old Reg Coates' marathon lasted for 60 hours, beating the previous record by three hours. That's it from us for tonight. Now the weather news from Michael Fish. Evening to you. I think it's going to be out with the winter weight blankets before very long. It's certainly feeling fairly chilly. This is the culprit, this cold front. It's moved down across the country, brought us some showery rain and introduced these uh, quite cold north to northwesterly winds. Here we are on the satellite picture, a ribbon of cloud now pushing into France and a fair number of showers packing in behind across the British Isles. Let's look back a few hours though. This is where the front was around the middle of the morning across the Midlands and as I run a short sequence you can see just how quickly that worked its way down into France. These showers followed along behind and here's the area of low pressure stuck there over the North Sea. In fact it's running down towards Denmark and northern parts of Germany but a lot of isobars you'll notice. So another feature about the weather is the wind quite windy in western and indeed eastern areas at the moment and during the course of the night although winds ease off in the middle of the country later on in the night and during tomorrow they freshen up again around many of those coasts with the strongest winds feeding down the north sea anyhow apart from the winds we're going to have a fair number of showers i think during the night most of them in these northern areas and around western coast but i think they'll start to filter across to the east coast later on in the night and one or two of those showers could be quite heavy few if any though getting through to the more central areas a fairly chilly night in the Scottish glens there might be a touch of ground frost that's the air temperature though and that compares to about eight or nine in other parts of the country and uh, as I said a while ago pretty windy with it now tomorrow for central and southern parts the day starting off dry with a good deal of sunshine elsewhere a fair number of showers scattered about some of them could be quite heavy What's going to happen is, I think, that during the morning, cloud will bubble up in the south, and by the middle of the day, showers will be breaking out, and come the afternoon, some of the showers in central and southern parts could be quite heavy with hail and thunder. On the other hand, in northern parts, especially over Scotland and Northern Ireland, the opposite happening. The heavy showers dying away, so not very many around by the afternoon, and those that are should be, generally speaking, on the light side. Here's your temperatures, uh, pretty windy everywhere, and I think that's going to make it feel quite cool. 14 or 15 is the upper 50s. That's all for now. A very good night to you. Gentlemen, we have three months. Tomorrow, the race is on for the four-minute mile. Roger. You are as prepared as you will ever be, both physically and mentally. You've got to do it. You've got to make the attempt. If uh, Landy or Santi get there first, you'll... A fight to the finish in the four-minute mile tomorrow at 9.30 on BBC One.